Hi everybody. Um, 16 years ago I started an open source project, nothing serious, uh, you know, just a hobby. And uh, people started using it and um, I, so I started adding uh, test, uh, tests and documentation and stuff like that. And um, after about seven years uh, I had joined Red Hat meanwhile, I, uh, I was uh, able to work on it full time. And uh, now, um, yeah, 16 years later, uh, it's used all across the globe for all kinds of planning problems. So um, let me uh, 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 go through this project and explain you a, bit, a little bit more about it. So what I'm going to show you today is we're going to try to solve this uh, planning problem. We're going to try to assign lessons to rooms and to time slots, and we're going to write an application. And more, um, I'll show you how to write an application when you click on the solve button, that it actually solves that with artificial intelligence, with our, our constraint solver. So, um, what's the problem I would like to show you to solve today? What I want to focus on is just one planning problem, and there's many more planning problems. But this is the one I want to focus on so you get an idea on how to code this yourself. Is we need to assign a number of lessons to a number of rooms and to a number of time slots. So over here you can see we have four lessons, math, chemistry, French and history. We have a number of rooms, room A, room B. We have a number of time slots, 8.30 to 9.30, 9.30 to 10.30. And we have to decide which lesson goes in which room at which time. Seems simple. Except for the fact, of course, that some of these uh, lessons have the same students. So, for example, math and chemistry are both being taught to the ninth grade. And chemistry and French are both being taught by the same teacher, Marie Curie. And French and history have the same students. So what are we going to do? We're going to write an application that, if you give this to a constraint solver like uh, OptoPlanner, um, that we get a solution like this. Now, if you look at this solution, what you will see is... Um, it's scheduled math and French at the same time, which is fine because they don't have the same students, 9th grade and 10th grade. They don't have the same teacher, Alan Turing and Marie Curie, so it's all fine. right? And same thing with chemistry and history. So, um, now, uh, why is this a difficult problem? Why, why not solve this by hand? Well, um, if you remember from high school when they had to make, make these uh, back then, um, you probably saw it sometimes took a couple of weeks for the, the lesson schedule to stabilize. And it, it is a very difficult, uh, very difficult exercise. And just to give you an idea why it's a very difficult exercise is how, how many combinations would you have? If you have like four lessons, how many possible ways can you schedule those in these four, four slots, in these two rooms and two time slots? If you have 400 lessons uh, and in 400 slots, how, how many ways could you do that? So let's take a look at that. So... Um, Let's look at the size of the search space, all possible ways you could schedule those lessons into those rooms. So here we have those uh, four uh, times, those four slots basically, so uh, in two rooms and two time slots. And we could schedule math in the first room, room A at 8.30, or in room B at 8.30, or in room A at 9.30, or in room B at uh, 9.30, right? So that's four different options. Now, for each of these four different options, we can then take the next lesson, we can take the history lesson, and we could decide, okay, we're going to schedule that, let's presume we've scheduled uh, math in room A at 8.30. Again, we could do the same with the history lesson. You could immediately see, of course, this would look like a very bad idea, because now we have two lessons in the same room at the same time. But for all of the other options here, over there, we also have four branches, right? So now we have already a bunch more combinations, but much more... Uh, for just scheduling those two lessons into four slots. And then, of course, if we try the third lesson, and I've chosen to actually break this uh, branch out and this branch out, you can see we see here to assign the chemistry lesson. Um, we could assign it again, you know, first slot, second slot, third slot, fourth slot. Uh, or if we had actually went with this case, where Matt was uh, at 8.30 and um, history was in the same room, uh, we could then go through uh, and, again, put out chemistry in those four options. And then, of course, we can do the same thing with the French lesson. And you might say, okay, this one, this solution over here, we have uh, math in the first room, um, and history also, but in different, uh, um, in both at 8.30, different rooms, and uh, chemistry and French also assigned. You might think this is a good uh, solution, but in fact, if you look from through the previous one, uh, previous slide, you'll see that these actually have the same teacher. So chemistry and French actually have the same teacher, and here history and French actually have the same students. So those are actually not the feasible solutions. And in fact, one of the feasible solutions, the ones where you say, okay, we can actually execute this plan, the ones I showed earlier, is in one of these branches, hidden away. 
right? So the question is, how can we get to that feasible solution or that most optimal solution as quickly as possible, right? And how big is the search space? Let's presume we look at every single thing. How, how big is the search space here? Well, for the first thing, we had four different states. Now for the, uh, for the you know, assigning math only. When we started assigning history, we had four times four different states. So we had 16 different states. It's four to the power two. When we sign the third one, we go to uh, four times four times four, so four to the power three, 64 different states. And for the fourth one, we already have 265 different states. So how does this continue? What happens when you have 400 lessons uh, assigned to 400 slots? 400 lessons times 400 slots, that's 400 to the power 400, which is something like 10 to the power 1040. So let me just bring, let me zoom in that, that a little bit. So if you assign n lessons, the entire search space is n to the power n. If we assign 400 lessons, that means it ends up something around 10 to the power 1040. Anybody get an idea how many uh, atoms there are in the observable universe? So think about every grain of salt, every, uh, every atom in the air right here, right? Count those all up, including all of those on all of our planets and all of our suns and, uh, and, and the stars we can see in the sky, right? Well, that's about 10 to the power 80. So, um, so what happens if we can do this more optimally, right? Because you could, if you go back here, you could say, okay, uh, the moment I actually assign these here, in the same room at the same time, I don't have to look at any of those branches below there. All the branches over here, these branches here, I don't have to look at those. So I can probably throw 99% of this search tree away. If you throw 99% away of a number of 10 to the power 1040, your search base is 10 to the power 1038. You have, it's a drop in the ocean, right? So you need much, much smarter algorithms than, than, than doing some smart decisions there, right? or very different algorithms. So this kind of planning problems is not just for lesson scheduling, not just high schools have these kind of planning problems, but also, for example, employee rostering. You want to assign a number of shifts to a number of employees and you have to decide which employee does which, which shift at which time, right? So here we have a morning shift, an afternoon shift and uh, evening shifts, and we are assigning these to employees with different skills. So here we have two nurses, an engineer and uh, a designer. And um, then, of course, we have a number of what we call constraints. Now, constraints come in two forms, typically. Well, actually, sometimes more than two, but the, in the simple cases, they come in two forms, hard constraints and soft constraints. So hard constraints are things like this. You only want to have one shift per day per employee, right? Uh, you only want, when a certain skill require when a certain shift requires a certain skill. So, for example, this uh, afternoon shift requires the nurse skill. We want to make sure we assign somebody with that skill. Um, here, in engineering skill, we need we need assigned engineer. Now, if you do this, of course, in a hospital, what you would get is, um, for example, to work in the maternity uh, uh, department, uh, to do a shift there, you need to have a certain skill. Uh, but uh, the, the nurses who work who have that skill can also do normal normal shifts, right? So it, it's a much more var, var, you know closer variety than of course nurses and engineer skill. But it, it's the same principle. And then of course you might have have hard constraints like certain contracts, certain employees can only work during the week and cannot do night work or things like that. And on top of that you have soft constraints. Soft constraints are things like you can only work five consecutive shifts in a row. Um, and uh, we want to do forward rotation, which is really, really good for the health of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the employees. For example, forward rotation, rotation means is that if you have a, a morning shift, you can have an evening shift the next day. But if you have an evening shift, you don't want to get a morning shift the next day because between those two shifts, there's only eight hours. And it's not enough time to go home, get some food and actually have a good night's sleep, right? And so that also means that that the servers, uh, you know, the, they, they will not do their job as well if they didn't have a, a good night's sleep, right? So there's, it's good for, the, for uh, not just the employee, but also for the, um, uh, the organization, right? And um, the big one here is the day off requests, right? Um, so what is the day off request? A nurse says, for example, or, you know, of one of the employees or security guards, if we're assigning security guards, they say, okay, I want to be Friday off because I like to go out on Friday. And other, other employees might say, I want to be, you know, Wednesday afternoon off because I want to take care of my grandchildren, right? And but the more we can say, yes, you get your preferable days off, the better, right? And so uh, we can take more of these requests uh, in, in account by automating this. And we can, uh, we've done tests with this, we've seen this in production. We can say yes half of the time more, 
So basically means, you know, we make them, let's say, 50% happier, uh, depending on how you measure, of course. Um, now, employee rostering is all great and all fine and it applies to all, all kinds of, you know, any employee that's uh, not working 9 to 5, I would argue. But arguably, the most, interesting vehicle, uh, the most interesting planning problem is probably vehicle routing. So in vehicle routing, what do we need to do? Uh, is we need to send the number of uh, vehicles to a number of locations across the country. To, to these particular dots, we, in this case, we're, for example, delivering items. But it also could be, for example, a technician that has to install something with people's home, let's say a telco, or uh, needs to go to certain locations to fix the electricity grid, or um, you know anything you can think of, and um, what we want to do is we want to uh, op optimize their routes, right? So we have to decide which vehicle, you know, which driver, which technician goes to which location, and in which order do they do that. There's a number of constraints, of course. So if you're delivering items, that could be capacity constraints, like here, 20 tons. If you're actually a technician who does, has to do a certain amount of work there, it would be the amount of hours they can drive around. And by the time, they, what time they need back, for example, eight hours, and then they need to be able to get back. You might have, have certain skills or certain um, you know, things on the vehicle, like in this case, uh, for uh, to deliver here, you need to have an armed vehicle because it's an expensive delivery. You might be dealing with time windows. We promised the customer or the location there that we would arrive there in the morning or between 8 and 10, right? And of course, the big thing you want to do is you want to reduce the amount of travel time. You have any idea how much travel time we could actually reduce if we automate this versus what is happening now in production? So we had this one case um, with um, tens of thousands of vehicles and um, their management expected a 1% driving time reduction and would have saved them literally you know, millions, right? Um, it was 25% less driving time. So they, they vastly underestimated this. Um, so they were quite happy with that. What was the results of that? The result is year over year, they reduced their CO2 emissions output by tens of millions of kilograms. Uh, every year, as of since they put this in production. Um, I was quite happy about that because if you calculate it, it's like flying from, um, I guess, Brussels to New York 25 uh, uh, times a day, right? Uh, you know, 25 persons do doing that flight. Um, back and forth, actually. So that's every single day what, what the amount of CO2 they, they, uh, they uh, save. They were quite happy about the fact that it saved them 100 millions of dollars per year. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that, was a, that was a big shock. So that's why I, I would argue vehicle routing is really the, the number one um, um, interesting case, especially if you're um, interested in these kinds of results. But there's many more. There's maintenance scheduling, you know, doing grids or equipments, elevators, escalators. Uh, there's agenda scheduling when you want to assign court hearings. Uh, there's the, or TV advertisements. There's job shop scheduling when you are building things like a car in, in a factory and you need to figure out uh, which, uh, which uh, thing on the, on, the, on the car happens in which order and you can optimize that and, and so forth and so forth. You want to re reduce your make span and things like that. So, so the, the world is full of planning problems. If you've ever walked into an airport, there's security guards there. Those need to be, that's shift assignment. There's gate there, that's flight, that's planes to gate uh, assignment. Uh, the gates, the, the flight's taking off, which airplane is actually taking off and is flying which direction, that's uh, another planning problem. Um, which crew is going into which uh, air uh, flight um, and, and uh, coming back in with other flights, it's, it's all planning problems. The, the, the world is full of them. Um, and so one solution there is our uh, AI constraint solver for OptoPlanner, which is open source, Apache license. So it's fully open source. Um, it's sponsored by Red Hat, by the way. And so um, you, you can just use it, and uh, many people do. Um, you can use it from Java, but you can also use it from Kotlin and Scala. So we have an example in Java and in Kotlin. We have Scala users out there. We don't have an example out of the box. Um, we, you can use it from plain Java, just embedded. You can use it from Quarkus, and you can use it from Spring. So we have a Quarkus extension and a Spring starter, uh, which you can use. And uh, yeah, you can use it for Maven and Gradle. And we actually have examples for all of this. So we have a Java, a plain Java example. We have a, a Quarkus one, a Spring one, a Maven one, uh, and some of the, you know all of these three actually build both with Maven and Gradle. Um, and we have many different use cases also, and those only build with Maven, but the, the basic tree actually show that how to do it with, with Gradle too. Um, so we're going to build this application, right? So let's see uh, how do we do that. Um, so 
I've already started an app, an app. so um, I've already started a project and I've already put some things in there. I've, in this particular case, I've chosen to go with Quarkus and um, I've already uh, exposed the REST service and uh, with some JSON, I've pushed, pushed that to in a browser with a nice UI to, to visualize that school timetabling and I've uh, hooked it up to a relational database uh, where we store the things. Um, there is no AI in this yet so, uh, at this point. So uh, let me just show you that. I have that here. So this is the application. Um, there's a few a bunch of code in here, but just to prove if I actually go in here and I look for, let's say, OptoPlanner, right? You will see there's no OptoPlanner in here yet. I do have already put OptoPlanner part of the POM, so it is already in the class path. You can see that here I've taken the OptoPlanner Quarkus extension. Um, if you would have used Spring, you would use the Spring Starter. If you would have used uh, plain Java, then you would just add OptoPlanner Core directly. Um, but yeah, uh, this gives it, it makes it a bit easier to integrate. So, um, here we go. Okay, so um, let's take a, talk a, take, a, uh, take a look at the domain. So what is the domain behind this? So we want to implement this case. So what are the domain classes? How would the domain classes look behind this? So um, we have um, a time slot and a room class. So the time slot class has a, a day of week. This comes from uh, Java uh, time, of course. Day of week is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so forth. Please don't ever use anything else, but don't, please never use Java util .date, right? You are going to run into problems there. Always use java.time um, and uh, these kinds of objects. And then there's a start time and an end time. That's a local time, again, from java.time. Um, I don't have a date in here. Why not? If you look at the problem a minute ago, we actually are scheduling uh, a week's worth of lessons and we'll copy paste that every week. Uh, that's how the high schools do it. However, if you look at uh, different use cases, for example, for a university, you will see you probably have this domain a little bit differently because you'll probably actually be not this scheduling one week that you copy paste every week, but uh, you know an entire semester where every date might be completely different, right? Um, so, and, and so, Depending on your model, you will you will do th things differently there. But in this case, it's quite simple. You just have a day of week and then uh, from when till when the time slot is. Then we have a room class, which has a name, something like you know room A, room B, room C. And then we have a lesson class, which has uh, a subject, like math, French, history, right? And a teacher, like Marie Curie, Alan Turing, and so forth. And then we a student group, 9th grade, 10th grade, and so forth. And we're going to have to assign these lessons to a time slot and to a room, right? So the time slot and the room are actually not filled in before we get have our a for before our AI solver actually starts solving this first, right? So uh, let's take a look at the coding behind this. I will start up the application with Maven Quarkus Dev right now. So here we go. Um, let's okay. Here we go. So Maven Quarkus Dev. Um, if I now go to localhost. This is a local host. Let me check here. So uh, the reason I'm starting up in dev mode is because as I start adding things, you will see the results of that immediately. Uh, you might see there was a warning here. The warning was just this, the thing that it says, okay, you have an OptoPlanner extension in there, but there's actually no OptoPlanner code in there, uh, which uh, like I showed earlier. So we'll be adding that in a minute. Here we go, local host. This is the application. So we have our rooms, rooms A, B, C here. We have a number of time slots here. Uh, we have a number of unassigned lessons. And the AI's job will be to take each of these lessons, um, about 20 or so, and put them into uh, these time slots and these rooms and make sure that we fulfill all of the constraints. Constraints are things like we don't want to have two lessons in the same room at the same time. right? But also we don't want to have two teachers teaching two lessons at the same time or two students having to attend the same, student, uh, the same lesson at the same time. And that's why we have these buttons here on the top. So we can easily switch, okay, what, how does it look like per teacher? and per student group, okay? So let's take a look at the code behind that. Um, here's the domain classes, here we go. Um, so we have a room class, as I uh, mentioned earlier. The room class just has the name, as you can see, but also all of my uh, entities have a database ID. I've put this into the database with a simple JPA indentation saying this is an entity. Uh, this is the database ID that needs to be generated by the database. And beyond this, there's just some getters and setters in this, of course, um, uh, as a Java, right? And then um, time slot. 
very similar. We have the ID again, and then we have those three properties I showed. Day of week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Start time, let's say 8.30, and then end time 9.30, for example, right? Uh, and again, for the rest, just getters and setters. Um, and then we have our lesson class, right? And the lesson is, uh, again, uh, we put it in a database. That's why the entity thing there. And we have uh, an ID, subject, math, French and so forth, teacher, Marie Curie and so forth, student group, nine grade and so forth, the time slot and the room. And you can see these are many to one relationships in JPA because multiple lessons will actually end in the, up in the same time slots, but hopefully not in the same time slot and the same room uh, uh, um, for, for two lessons, right? Um, then I also have a timetable class. This is the class that I sent to the, to, the, uh, to the front end because I need a way to take all of my rooms, all of my time slots, all of my lessons and say, okay, I ship it to the, to the client. Uh, so this is what my REST servers actually returns. Say, okay, give me your timetable and this is the thing it returns. And this is also what I showed in the UI. Um, I save everything into a database. Um, so I have these, this is from Panache. It's very similar to Spring Data if you're familiar with that, but it basically says, okay, I want something which, uh, it, this is a lesson repository where I can say, okay, please save this lesson, uh, please l find all my lessons and so forth. And when I actually look at the REST service that says, okay, load me the, the timetable, what I do is I create a new timetable object and I, from the database, I list all of the time slots, I list all of the rooms and I list all of the lessons as you can see here. I sort them by some properties, of course, and that is the timetable I give back to the client and I play with. There's some da test data you saw also, and that's being done here. There's a test data um, um, thing here where I inject those repositories that, that allow me access to the database. I listen to the startup event, and I say when every time this Quarkus application starts up, I, uh, I want to create this test data, right? Uh, and put that in the database. So you can see I created time slots here. I can create the rooms and the lessons. Now let's have some fun. I'm going to actually change one of these rooms. Let's say this is the... DevOx UK room, and so when I change it here, just to see if it all works, you can see the change happens here immediately, right? So um, in an immediate re refresh. Just to give you an idea on what happens there behind the scenes, this is Quarkus Dev playing for us. So what happens is uh, when we start up, it compiles the resources, creates the schema, insert, inserts the test data. Um, every time we then ask, oh, give me the index, you know, give, give me that, that the, this thing, right? It says, okay, I'll just execute the SQL queries. But if we actually change something in our ID, if we change one of the sources, what actually happens is Quarkus detects that and says, okay, wait a second, the next time you ask for the get index, right, the next time we hit that refresh button on the top of our browser, what it actually says is I'm going to trigger restart. And instead of just doing the SQL queries, it's going to compile the changed sources, drop the schema, insert the test data, then actually do the REST request, and return all that, and that takes less than a second. And just to show you that it takes less than a second, it took, well, it took a second here. That's, oh, uh, probably some, let's try this again. Why this is more than a second. So let's go to something else, the room E or something. Let's refresh here. Maybe have something running in the background. Oh, let's refresh here. Here we go. And that took the live load less than a second. That's, that looks better, right? Um, so that's really nice, and we're going to use that in a minute once we start adding uh, some optoplanner stuff. So let's start uh, doing that. Here we go. So let's add some AI planning optimization. Um, so we add in the optoplanner extension in, in our architecture. And um, then we need to hear, tell optoplanner, what can you change? Can optoplanner say, okay, I am going to change the subject of a lesson. Instead of teaching math, we'll teach, uh, I don't know, some, something else, right? Um, music, right? Instead of, or the teacher, right? Instead of Marie Curie teaching chemistry, uh, we'll give that to, you know, um, Indiana Jones or something like that, right? So, of course, they can't. So what Optoplanner can actually change is the time slot and the room, right? Everything, everything else is not the decision that our AI can make. So we need to tell Optoplanner what are the decisions you can make? What can I change? And we do that by annotating those particular properties with a planning variable. So we tell OptoPlanner, you can, you can pick the time slot and you can pick the room. Those are planning variables. Now, any, any class that has one or more planning variables needs to have a planning entity annotation. That's just a way to know for OptoPlanner to know, okay, in this class, there are things that I need to change. And, um, it, it, and it needs it for a, a number of reasons. Okay, so... 
before we give the problem to OptoPlanner, so if, let's say we have 20 lessons, right, and we have 10 time slots and, and two rooms or three rooms, or whatever, um, before we give the pro those lessons to OptoPlanner, all of those lessons do not uh, are have time slot null, NULL, have, have the room NULL. Those are not filled in. After OptoPlanner solves it, they will all be filled in. So that's what, it, what it's doing for us, right? So, um, okay, let's uh, start coding that. So we go here, we go to our lesson class, and we're going to tell them, okay, this is, so this is a class where something changes during planning. So this is an at planning uh, entity, right? Um, and then the time slot and the room are the two, fee the two things that we want OptoPlanner to fill in for us. So we'll make this a planning variable, the time slot, and for the room, we will do the same. Now, can OptoPlanner just say, okay, you want me to fill in a time slot? I'll just create one for you. Create a new time slot, Sunday evening, 10 a.m., right? Well, it doesn't work like that, right? It has to pick from the time slots we give it to this. And so somewhere we're going to have, a, we need to give a range of, of time slots. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, I'm going to provide you a value range provider with a, with a value range. So and I'm going to call this the time slot range. And somewhere else you'll see where we have a list of our time slots. I'll say, okay, that the ID of that value range is time slot range. And that's when OptoPlanner knows, okay, for these 20 lessons, here for each of those 20 lessons, these are, the ten, for example, 10 time slots I can pick from, right? Um, and then, of course, we have the same for the room. So for, again, for the room, somewhere we'll have to make a room range, a list of rooms, and then OptoPlanner can choose from those. Um, okay, fair enough. And and. Some advice, this is usually the difficult, the most difficult part when you start with OptoPlanner. What is my planning entity? What changes during planning? And what are my planning variables? Making those choices is very important. We have a domain modeling guide in our documentation around that. Um, if you see, if you find that difficult in your case, and some, for some planning problems, it is difficult, read that modeling guide, go through it, and it'll, and it'll help you make the right choices on how to design that. Um, the rest of this is actually much simpler. It's always the same, but um, I'll take you through it anyway because, of course, we want this to actually run in a sec in a few seconds. So, the timetable is actually the, that class that has a list of all of our rooms in our lesson and our time slots, right? It's also the timetable is also the the, the the instance we give to OptoPlanner. We'll call the solve method, and in the solve method, there will be one thing we give it, and that's our timetable instance. It will solve that, and it will give us back another timetable instance. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, when when it's solved, it's actually planning solution. So we're going to assign an annotate this with a planning solution annotation. So that means this is the thing we're going to give to OptoPlanner. It's going to solve it for us and give it back. Um, in that timetable solution, we have a number of lessons. Right. This is our lesson list. So OptoPlanner needs to find where are those instances that I can change. Right. And that's why in this lesson list, we have to tell them, okay, this is actually our planning entity collection property, which literally means this is a collection, for example, a list or a set of uh, planning entities, and this is the property that holds them, right? So that's how we tell OptoPlanner, pick those, that's where you find your lists of lessons. That's the ones you need to start assigning. It then looks into the lesson class to see, okay, there's a planning variables there on rooms and time slots, so I'll, I'll need to assign those. Again, we need to, we need to find what, what list of uh, time slots we can choose from. This, that's over here, that's our time slot list. So we're going to provide a value range, and this is the ID, and the ID will make that the same as in the other one, right? So this is the time slot range. So by annotating this value range provider here, we can, we can make sure that in the lesson side, that to fill in this particular variable on each of the lesson instances, it will choose from uh, this list of time slots. Right? And in a similar way, we can do that here. Value range provider is the room range. Here we go. Now, when OptoPlanner actually solves this, it will try to quantify how good the solution is. And it will do that through something called a score. And more, more particularly, in this case, we're going to use a hard soft score because we only care about hard and soft constraints in this particular case. So you, there's, different, there's variations on that, but most cases will start with a hard and soft score. So we're going to actually put a field on here. This is the score field. And then OptoPlanner, after it's solved, uh, once it's solving it, it will actually say, okay, it will actually put the quality of our, solu of our solution into that uh, score thing. So after we're done, we can actually check, do we have a feasible solution? You know, or, or don't we have, you know, uh, are we sure we don't break any constraints? And it can also tell us, you know, how if we break soft constraints, how many soft constraints we have broken and to which degree. 
Um, we need to annotate that with the planning score annotation so the planner knows, okay, that's, that's where that score field is. Okay, now we'll also need constraints, right? This is our model. Now, what, what are our goals? Where, where do we want to get to, right? This is what we give him, and then he tells us back the decisions, but we also need to tell him what are the, what are the goals, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a constraint provider, and that gives us our goals, our constraints, our hard and soft constraints. But for right now, and so to do that, you implement the constraints provider interface, constraint provider interface. I'll just generate this method here. And for now, I'm going to just return no constraints, just an empty list of uh, an empty array of constraints, right? Um, so basically, we, we're going to tell them you can do whatever you want, and we'll see the results of that quite soon. And then we'll, we can start playing with that by adding some constraints. Now we still need to hook it up, right? So if I actually click in that button over here, let me just show you. If I actually click in that uh, button over here, we'll get an exception. And the reason we get an exception is because uh, if we go to the code here. Uh, alt F. Yeah, here we go. There's an exception because in this method, as you can see, there's an, no such you know, unsupported operation exception. So that's the part we actually have to implement right now. And so that's what I'll be doing, doing right now. And then we can see how OptoPlanner assigns our lessons. What I'm going to do, so how do you solve a problem with OptoPlanner? You use the solver manager, which, which has that solve method. So I'm going to uh, inject um, a, a solver manager. So if you work in, for example, uh, Spring, that you would auto-wire uh, Solver Manager. And then uh, this, oh, not this, uh, and this Solver Manager will be of type, uh, will be solving timetables for us, right? Um, it's a particular one to solve that kind of problems. And anytime we ask it to do something, we can give it a job ID. And uh, we can choose that type too. And here I've chosen a long type. So that could also be a string or a UID. Um, this is only when you would be solving times. It would be interesting if you would be solving timetables of multiple schools, right? You, you create an, uh, you know, a service or something where you can solve all of the timetables for all of the schools, let's say here in England, and then um, you can actually solve, be solving multiple at the same time, and each one has a different uh, problem ID, and, and you could then say, okay, I want a long there or I want a UUID there or something like that. So in our solve method. So when we push that button, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, solver manager, please solve and listen. What's the listen thing? Well, I want to see every time OptoPlanner finds a new, better solution, a better uh, solution to this problem, I want to immediately see that in my UI. And so by listening, that means that every time it does, it immediately will store the better solution into the database. So when my UI comes around, it can immediately show that, right? Uh, the UI does have a, a two-second refresh. You could also, if you have a... Um, if you don't do a polling approach, but you actually have like um, a WebSocket or something, you could also push it back to the client immediately. But in this case, I've chosen a simpler, a simpler approach. So what I get in the solve and listen method, I, I, get, I have three parameters. The first one is just the job ID. It's basically the, uh, but I'm just going to hard code that onto one because I only have one timetable. So I'm, I'm not going to worry about this in the simple case. And um, then I have uh, two methods, a read method and a write method. The read method gives me that problem ID, that one L, and I need to and uh, I need to say, okay, load the timetable. So I have a, a, a load timetable method here, right, which I shown earlier, which says, okay, I create a new timetable by listing all of the time slots, all of the rooms, and all of the lessons. Uh, you can see this is transactional. It's really cool about Quark is this, even though this is a protected method, which I'm calling from the same class. That transactional thing actually works. It's not ignored. Um, and then, um, so I, this is how I load the problem. And the second is, is I need to save it. So when I have a timetable, how do I, I need to save this? And I'm going to call a save method I have set up here, which is going to take, let me show you that save method here. Again, transactional is going to go through all of the lessons and then find the same lesson in the database and set the time slot and the room uh, the same as, as the one I've just sent it to, right? Um, for those, this might be a bit strange to see for some people if you're not too familiar with JPA, but uh, this is about how, how JPA uh, manage the, you know, the, the, the um, uh, what they call it, the context, right? So um, here we go. Maybe we want to terminate it earlier. We can do that here too. So we can just say, okay, solver manager, when, this, when we call the stop solving method, uh, method, please do terminate early. And particularly that particular job of this, this you know, the same job we started here, 
if you want to terminate that early. Um, so let's take a look. We do a refresh. We will scroll down here and do a refresh here. Here we go. Quark is restarted. I can click the solve method and it starts solving for us. Like I said, there's a, a polling mixing mechanism, so a two second delay until you see the results. And what has Alt Planner done for us? It says, okay, I'll do that for you. I'll assign all of your lessons in room A at 8.30. There are no constraints. I can do whatever I want. So uh, that, that looks... That's a problematic, right? That's not something we can actually send to the schools and say, this is the new schedule, right? Um, maybe the students will like it, just one hour of lessons and then can, they can go home, but not, not, not good in reality. So, um, how can we implement those constraints now? So, we could say, um, so there's hard and soft constraints. So again, hard constraints must not be broken, soft constraints, we don't want to break them, but if we have to, we will. Right? And as, min, as little as possible of them, maybe weighted. Some constraints are, some soft constraints are more important than other soft constraints. Right? Um, one way you could do it is this way. Right? So what you could do is, okay, okay how do I detect if two, two lessons are assigned in the same room at the same time? How do we solve it that uh, if we go to our problem here, that we don't start assigning all of those lessons in the same room at the same time? So we could say, okay, we create a hard score. Uh, zero, and then we go through all of the lessons, uh, and then we go through all of the other lessons, and if those two lessons are in the same time slot, right, and in the same room, we're going to reduce the hard score by one. And we probably also want to check in there to make sure that we don't penalize that if they're actually the same lesson A and B. And then we can make uh, return a hard score this. And we support this. You can do this. We don't recommend to doing it. Why not? Well, there's a couple of problems with this. There's two big performance problems. There's a scalability pr problem with this and a performance problem with this. Scalability, the biggest problem is it's not incremental. So that means when OptoPanner wants to go through about 100,000 timetables per second, that's what it likes to do. Try to actually try out 100,000, uh, you know, score 100,000 timetables per second. There's no way you can get to that with this kind of code because when the room of the math lesson changes, right, the entire, and it, it says, okay, let me take the math lesson and let me swap that with the French lessons, for example, or let's say the history lessons, for example, it would, it will, it will, and it runs then this entire piece of code, it will actually check if French and chemistry use the same room. That doesn't scale, that really, that's, that's a big O notation worse uh, of, of scalability. So instead of that, what you want to do is deltas. Now, and we have an interface for that too, and that's a one-way ticket in, into, um, you know, the asylum, because it's, 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 it's very, very difficult to write this kind of code and listen to the change events and, and do the deltas and so forth. Um, I've written a couple, and um, six months later, you look at them and you go like, what does this do? And then when you need to add an extra constraint, it's, it's, it's very, very painful and difficult. So we have the option that we, 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 we actually uh, recommend, and that's our, what we call our constraint streams API. And I'm going to show you that here right now. So I'm going to add here a constraint, call it the room conflict constraint. And I'm going to uh, pass my constraint factory. That's the thing that uh, is going to build the constraints, uh, that helps me build the constraints. So here we have a room conflict constraint. So I'm going to say, okay, constraint factory. What I want you to do, this is more functional, and you'll see that in a minute. Um, what I want you to do is, I want you to, to, for each of the lessons, right, I want you, and let's import the lessons, I want you to join that, like in SQL, very, this, it's very SQL-like, but you can actually run any sign of code, with any other lesson, and then when the, uh, these two lessons are in the same room at the same time, I want you to penalize that. So that's the general thing of things. You do a for each, you might do some joins and stuff like that, some filters, and you end up in a, in a penalize. So, is, and the, so let's take a look at the for each with the join here. Any two lessons? No, because if these lessons are in, not in the same room or not at the same time, it's actually fine, right? We only want to penalize if they're in the same room at the same time. So what are we going to do is we're going to say, okay, I want to do an equal constraint here, where I say lesson is actually the same room, and also lesson is actually the same joiners equal lesson is actually the same time slot. Now, for the record, um, 
you, you can do for each of a lesson with another type of object. It doesn't need to be a, a lesson again. And then you can actually specify how do you get the room from the lesson from the left side and how do you get it from the right side and so forth. Um, you know, this is, this, this is just the, the most condensed form of the API I'm showing you, but it's, it's, it's very, very broad and very, very, there's many, many methods there that you can use, a very rich API. Now, there's an, an additional advantage on this because by doing it this way, um, internally, Optoplanner can do uh, indexing and hashing for you, which is another big performance gain because it can check if I take a lesson and instead I don't need to go through all of the other lessons to, to combine it with that. I can actually just do in an index lookup, find the same lesson within the same room in the same time slot and immediately see if they are, um, you know, if, if, if we should do a penalize or not. Um, so that, that's, it's, that's the second big uh, gain you get by switching to something like the uh, Constraint Streams API. So anyway, if this happens, we're going to say this is a room conflict and we're going to hit OptoPlanner on the head. So don't do this with a heart constraint, right? And this is just one heart, but you could actually say of heart and say, okay, it's seven heart points, but I'll keep it simple and just say it's a one heart thing. So let's take a look at what happens now. If I go here, I do a refresh. Here we go. We click the solve button and OptoPlanner assigned all of the lessons for us. This to start looking better, right? So we don't have uh, no lessons in the same room at the same time. But uh, this is easy, right? You could do that. You could just take the lessons, just start pinning them up and problem solved. But there's more constraints. Why is this so difficult? Why is planning so difficult? Uh, here's the teachers. Uh, Marie Curie. I hope she can be in two places at the same time because she's teaching French and critics uh, at 930 at the same time on Tuesday. So that's not a good schedule here, right? This is not a feasible schedule. Here's the student groups. We, we want some students to be in two places at the same time, right? Chemistry and math at the same time here. So that's not a good thing. So what we can do is we can say, okay, um, I want to have a, a teacher conflict. Here we go. Um, here we go. And I'm going to have a constraint for that teacher conflict. So what do we do is we say, okay, um, I'm going to, for every teacher, uh, actually you can copy paste the code from here. So let's do that for a second. So what I can say, okay, for every lesson, join that with every other lesson where they don't, I don't care if they have the same room or not. I just care if they have the same teacher. And if those teachers are, if it's the same teacher for those two lessons, and it's actually at the same time slot, then we're asking a teacher to be in two places at the same time. Then we have a teacher conflict. All right, and again, let's penalize this as a hard constraint. We do a refresh here. There you go. We click the solve button. It's solving. Um, we see the results here. This looks okay. We go by teacher. See, this is now feasible. Marie Curie can actually do her schedule. And, uh, but again, we still have problems with the students. So let's do that again for students too. Here we go. So we have uh, a stu student group conflict. Uh, I'll just copy this one. All right. Say, okay, we have a student group conflict here. If they have not the same teacher, but the same student group, then this is a student group conflict. So again, for a lesson, join that with any other lesson that's in the same, that has the same student group, same teacher, uh, same time slot. And then of course, hit up the panel in the head. We don't want that. We could actually do the, the reverse too. We could actually reward that too, which is something we don't want to do here. But if you say, I want to write a positive constraint because I like being positive, um, then that's possible. But most constraints are typically written you know, more naturally in a negative way. You typically things you don't want to see in the planning. You want to penalize that. But there's a few cases where you, you would write positive constraints. Anyway, let's write it out. Hit the refresh button here. Click the solve. Um, here we go. Looks good. This is feasible. No, t no room conflicts. No teacher conflicts. No student groups conflicts. Right. Now um, you could do more of this. Right. If you look at this this teacher schedule, uh, you could argue, yeah, this is a feasible schedule. Schedule, but will our teachers be happy? Will yeah? Here, Darwin, he has to come for one hour on Monday morning and then for one hour on Tuesday morning. Um, we have Marie Curie here. Uh, she has all of these separate blocks. So. Um, what if we, can we not make sure that, um, you know, can we not fix that too? And that's what something you would do in soft constraints. Why? You will not be able to create a compact schedule uh, and make everybody perfectly happy. But what you can do is you can, for example, say, I want to minimize the amount of time that happens. 
or you might even want to do it fairly, right? You might want to say, okay, um, the per person who is worst off with the schedule, we want them, that person to be as best off as possible, and then the second person worst off, and then the third person worst off. Uh, we support that in OptoPlanner. It will take me a little bit more than the time I have left to explain, so I will not jump in it. Uh, actually, a lot more. It's, it's, it's a fairly mathematical uh, problem. But you have support on that, so you don't have to worry about that. You can just reuse, reuse what we have, right? So, um, and there's other constraints you could have. For example, for the students, you might want to avoid having, two, like here, two math lessons in a row. Um, you might, you know, you might want to say, okay, I want more variety in the schedule. And of course, we can add that uh, easily too. But that's out of the scope for today. So, um, if you want to get started with OptoPlanner, um, I warmly recommend you to go to the OptoPlanner website, and uh, there's a, you, you can find documentation there and, and so forth. But there's also a clone the quick starts code there, and I'll just show you right now. If we go here, here we go, toktoan.org. Here there's a clone the quick starts code. You click on that. Um, so, if you don't know what to do uh, this evening, oh, I double clicked something else here. Um, you clone this repository and you will find the example I've just shown you here in use cases uh, school time uh, school time tailing here. As you can see, you'll find many other use cases, vehicle routing, maintenance scheduling, employee rostering, vaccination scheduling, um, order picking and so forth. And um, if you want to see them in other technologies, here's technologies, you can see, okay, I want the Spring version, I want the Kotlin version. Um, we even have Python, but that's, uh, uh, that's called OptaPy, not OptaPlanner. That's, that's, that's much further away than, than the other stuff. Um, we have one with ActiveMQ, so you can try all this out. Uh, so do try it out, and uh, this is the code to run it. And uh, if there's any questions, I'll happily answer those. Thank you for listening. Okay. Yes. Uh, how good is this uh, in when you compare it to, for example, Google or Tools? Yes. Where is this deterministic uh, satisfaction yes. problem solving? So for vehicle routing, we beat them. It's quite simple. Uh, you do have to, in OptoPanner, turn on nearby selection, which is not turned on by default. But um, so I've I've been in multiple cases where uh, we were in direct competition. Uh, the, la the last one was a, an academic con uh, competition, but also with a couple of uh, customers, like uh, you know really big cases of vehicle routing, and um, they clearly saw that OptoPlanner just uh, you know. One quote I had, I'm not sure if it was Google OR anymore, tools, but they were trying Google OR tools too. One quote I've once heard is that we did in five minutes what took the others three hours to do. So, um, yeah, we feel quite comfortable uh, in that regard. Is that true for everything, um, for all planning cases? Um, for vehicle routing, so definitely when you scale out, uh, you know, we will definitely win. But um, there are cases of so like shift scheduling, we, we do well, but there are particular cases of, of which work well, better in the... So our tool is actually two different solvers, right? It's the vehicle routing solver that they have, which is very problem specific, which is hard to customize by the way too, but that's the one we clearly beat there. And then they have the one which is more uh, linear programming style, where you add your constraints as mathematical equations, right? Which is a fun thing on its own. <laughs> Um, and so I have actually uh, a benchmark of that against our cloud balancing one, where we also win, uh, when we scale out. Uh, but when you scale down, we do see that uh, it becomes interesting. So um, your mileage may vary, but um, if you run into, you know, contact us, ping me on Twitter or whatever, and I'm happy to look, take a look at that all the because, you know, we want to be the best. And, uh, but they're, they're, they're good, decent com competition. Uh, they're, um, they're, yeah, they're, they're, we respect them. Uh, yeah, definitely. Thanks. Um, I tried Opto Planner like 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, did the base uh, engine change si since then or just improved or that there was a radical change? Um, so many things changed in 10 years, as you can imagine. So the biggest one you probably saw is that I was not writing my constraints in DRL, but in plain Java. So code highlighting, debugging, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. 
faster. Um, so um, even though on under the hood we st we still use similar technologies, no, not we use some some interesting technologies there, uh, like the the rule engine. We have an implementation. We have an actually experimental implementation of of an alternative there too. Um, so we're always making it faster. It, you will see that it's much faster. Uh, you will also see we have better integration with all of the other toolkits. We have more algorithms. So the default algorithm these days is late acceptance hill climbing, but the original one was uh, Tabo Search at the time. Ten years ago, I think we were still using Tabo Search. Um, why would you care? Not really, but it's like garbage collection tuning. If you want to tune for the best possible results specifically to your use case, we have something called OptiPanner Benchmarker. And we have more algorithms now we can play with and tune with and to pick one which is best for your use case. Most users don't even do that, but you know, 1% of, of, uh, of yeah, $100 million is, is kind of worth doing it. So <laughs> it kind of depends on the use case. Um, the, what else? We have multi-threaded solving which is really fun. So you can use more of your course to solve on data set. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I came in a bit late. Um, with regard to the, so is that only uh, used for planning or can you use it for other, solving other problems? Uh, only used for planning, good question. Um, planning, scheduling, it, the, the, the problems are typically the same. So theoretically, so, fun, the real answer to that question is you can you, you only want to use it on NP hard problems or NP complete problems. We're basically saying um, I'm not going to give you an answer that that's that's that that makes sense, right? Because um, it's uh, if if you go on Wikipedia, you can find a good definition of that. But and there's like three thousands of these kinds of problems. Uh, some of them might um, there, there's like I know it's been used for. For game setting up the, the the so there's a few cases where you would do it. But would you not consider it planning? Not for an adversarial um, adversarial cases, but for cases where you would set up uh, a first playing field or something like that. Um, but generally, it's mostly planning and scheduling problems. That, that's the, that's that's the short answer, I think. I think we're out of time. I'll, I'll answer your, your question. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, let's answer at the door, maybe, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks.